Um, I'm very pleased to be here to give you an update on the very important work we're doing at Viasite. I think this is our third time presenting here, and I, I'm happy to say we've been able to show substantial progress each time we report. So Viasite is a San Diego-based company. We're focused on stem cell-derived cell replacement therapy. Um, it has a very accomplished team of scientists. The company's been around for over a decade focused on this field and really focused on the, the key al area that I'm going to talk about, type 1 diabetes. Uh, we have about 60 employees in the company. We have two novel proprietary platform technologies that we focus on and have developed over those that decade. One is the directed, regulatory compliant, and scalable differentiation of stem cells, in our case, embryonic stem cells. And all of those elements I just mentioned are important for, to have a really successful product. The second technology we focused on is macro encapsulation of cell delivery technology, and that's because we are using allogeneic cells, and therefore we need to protect those cells from the immune system. The product that we've been developing over that time is called VCO1 product candidate. It is a stem cell derived islet replacement therapy that is being developed for insulin dependent diabetes, initially focused on type 1 diabetes. It's the first embryonic stem cell derived therapy for diabetes to reach the clinic. We are currently in a clinical trial, and I'll tell you more about that in a bit, called Step 1. Uh, it's underway here in, in uh, San Diego as well as up in Canada. And this product really has potential to provide a functional cure for type 1 diabetes. So it's a very exciting opportunity, very clear and substantial commercial opportunity as well. The idea of uh, beta cell replacement, there is a, a good clinical proof of concept for that, and that's using human islet cadaver implants. And they, these studies have been being done for about uh, um, eight, over 10 years now. And you're able to achieve very sustained insulin independence in the majority of the patients out over five years with the way this is currently practiced. So it's a very effective treatment for a very high risk group of patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, the reason it's limited to that high risk patient population is one, it requires immune suppression, chronic, as long as the, the cells are in, you need to Im immune suppress. But the real limitation is cell source. It takes anywhere from two to three pancreases to harvest enough cells to treat a patient uh, with cadaver islets, and there's just a very limited supply of those cells. It's also very costly and fairly invasive. So what we're seeking to do using the embryonic stem cell cell approach uh, is to essentially address all of those limitations. Do this without the need for immune suppression, have an unlimited source of the cells, uh, less expensive and less invasive. So this is a snapshot of the product that we're developing, uh, VCO1. It really combines those two platforms I talked about. One is we use the directed differentiation to develop a line of pancreatic progenitor cells. These are cells that are essentially at the stage we've differentiated up to a point where they're destined to go on to become islets. Um, and then the second part of it, the product, is a, a device called Encaptra. It's a, a, immune, a macro encapsulation device that gives the immune protection. So VCO1 is surgically implanted under the skin. These cells go in the device and then implanted under the skin. And under, over a period of time in the animal models, at least, these differentiate uh, to become essentially, for all intents and purposes, islets under the skin and produce insulin and glucagon and somatostatin and all of the factors you think of with regard to an islet in a regulated fashion. Uh, we filed our IND on this last year and entered the clinic and uh, are doing the study now. So the three core elements of the product are shown here, and I'm not going to have time to delve into this in any detail in this short presentation, but one is the renewable cell source, the embryonic stem cell, but then we do a directed differentiation of those cells up to the pancreatic progenitor cells, and that is the, the biologic, the therapeutic product, if you will. And then the third element is the uh, encapsulation device. So we 
identified and banked a embryonic stem cell line that was derived from a embryo from a, a in vitro fertilization clinic a number of years ago. It was the cells have been tested and banked. We have mastered and working cell banks, and this really gives us an unlimited supply of starting material uh, for the product. So our starting material is a stem cell, but when we implant, we go to great lengths to make sure there are no stem cells when we do the implantation. So we go through a directed differentiation, and I can tell you this simple slide here of showing going from an embryonic stem cell up to a pancreatic cell represents about seven years of work and about 50 patents. Um, but we are able to take those PECO1 cells, put them in our device, and then have them differentiate to islets under the skin. So this just shows some data from a mouse model uh, showing these cells, and you can see the cells on the um, uh, right-hand side there, uh, the immunostaining uh, of these cells showing that the cell population after 16 weeks of implantation is made up of insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin, so beta, alpha, delta cells, uh, and other cells that make this up, and very similar to what you would ex see with an islet. Importantly, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, this is a micrograph of the cells inside the device, the, the gray wall there is the um, semi-permeable membrane, which is really the active part of this. That membrane allows the free flow of nutrients and oxygen, uh, proteins, including insulin, uh, glucose, back and forth, but excludes any cell-cell interaction. So none of the cells inside the device can get out, none of the, the patient cells can get in, and in this way we block that immune uh, response. And you can see it gets very well vascularized all along that semi-permeable membrane. There is a foreign body capsule that forms around it, uh, but it's a very well vascularized foreign body capsule. Um, without getting into data, I can tell you we've studied this in literally thousands of animals uh, in the mouse models that we use most uh, normally. When we put these into a mouse, a typical blood glucose level for a mouse is about 150 milligrams per deciliter. From a human perspective, that's hyperglycemic. So when we put these cells into a mouse, we essentially humanize that mouse. The, the cells will lower that mouse's blood glucose level down towards the human set point of around 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter and keep it there for the life of the mouse or until we take the cells back out, in which case it reverts back. Moreover, we can completely destroy the mouse beta cells and see no impact whatsoever on the blood glucose. We've never seen any evidence for hypoglycemia. These are very well-regulated cells, so it looks very promising from the animal studies. But of course, translating this to the patient is really where we need to be. Um, so the product candidate uh, that we're looking at right now in the clinical studies uh, is two devices that we use uh, that are cell-filled. Um, one is called an EN20. It's what we use in the mouse studies when we're doing these, but we're using them in the patients as sentinels, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. And then we have a dose-finding device, an EN250, where we actually will put in uh, different numbers of these EN250s in order to be able to do dose ranging. Um, and so right now we're implanting both sizes of device. It's a minimally invasive procedure. It's an outpatient procedure um, and uh, easily monitored via ultrasound. So if there was any issues, if there was any off-target growth that we haven't seen, but if there, it was to occur, uh, we can determine that and we can pull these out at any time. And that's a big safety advantage for this approach because at any given point, if we need to stop the therapy, we can pull the cells back out. So the trial that we are currently engaged in is called Step 1. Um, as I said, we filed the IND. We had it allowed in 30 days, which we were pleased with, no holds. Um, and we initiated the trial. The first center that we initiated was right here at UCSD, University of California, San Diego. It is a phase one, two trial. Uh, there are two cohorts. It's open label, dose escalating. Uh, the first cohort, which is the cohort we're currently in, is a subtherapeutic dose of cells. Uh, so we're giving a low dose of cells, not expecting 
expected to be efficacious, but really allowing us, one, to show that it's safe and well tolerated before we go to those higher doses, um, but also to allow us to, to develop the surgical and post-surgical procedures that are necessary to make sure that we get a good engraftment, because it is a traumatic experience for these cells when we implant them, and there is a period of healing that goes on uh, and uh, formation of those vascular networks, et cetera. So we need to make sure that we do it in such a way that the cells have the best chance of being effective and engrafting appropriately. So we're in the process of that now with the first cohort. Um, and once we get past that, then we go to a second cohort where we will plan to study about 36 patients. The nice thing is the endpoints are very clear. Um, it's insulin production. Uh, we expect to see efficacy within uh, about six months, uh, but we will continue treatment out for two years. So this is the endpoints of the trial. The sentinels, as I mentioned, these small devices are put in. These are really our, our, working, our workhorse right now for the trial because what we do with these is we implant these and then we pull them out periodically and we do histology on them. So we're looking at cell viability, vascularization, cell differentiation in these sentinels. So it gives us a really potent tool to develop the techniques to maximize the potential of the product. The primary endpoint when we get to the efficacy side of this will be safety and tolerance, but also insulin production as measured by C-peptide production, a, a biomarker for endogenous insulin production. Secondary endpoints will be changes in exogenous insulin dosing, uh, as well as frequency and severity of hypoglycemic events. So just a quick update on where we are in the trial. Um, we uh, have currently to date uh, treated 10 patients uh, in the cohort one, so this is at the subtherapeutic dose. Uh, as I said, the goal is to evaluate the safety, which so far that we've been pleased with what we've seen there, uh, and then to develop and optimize these surgical and post-surgical procedures. I think we're making very good progress on that as well. Uh, the number of patients that we study in this phase is really open-ended uh, based on our discussions with regulatory authorities. It's really data-driven. We want to make sure that we're completely confident that it's working well, that we're seeing the, the best potential for efficacy before we move into that second cohort. Uh, we did initiate a second site recently up at Canada with Dr. James Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is one of the, the world's leaders in islet cell transplant. He developed the Edmonton Protocol, which is the protocol that cadavers or islets are used. When successfully optimized, uh, assuming we are, we are successful with that, we would then take this to a data safety monitoring panel and look for a recommendation to go into that cohort too, which we hope to happen um, probably next year, early next year. So uh, from a, a corporate point of view, we have a very good IP landscape with regards to this. I'm not going to try to go into this slide, but we have over 56 US, issued US patents uh, and a couple hundred uh, pending applications worldwide covering the product and the technologies. Um, I do want to mention in terms of our financing, we are a private company. Uh, I want to highlight the fact that uh, you know, we've had venture investors including JJDC, the venture arm of J&J, &J, uh, is actually one of our largest investors, uh, is our largest investor. Um, but we've also had really tremendous support that we highly appreciate from CIRM. Uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine has awarded approximately $55 million for this project, and JDRF, which has put in uh, a substantial amount as well. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you again for your attention.